All right, so in this video, we're going to be doing some practice problems just to hone our skills with the uh, rotational concepts that we've learned in the last few videos. And we'll start off with a classic static equilibrium problem. Basically, the situation is you have a ladder leaning up against a frictionless wall, and it's held up essentially by that force, among others, and the friction down here on the floor. And what we want to know is what is the total force of the floor. So that includes both, you know, the friction and the normal force. So we start off, of course, by drawing a free body diagram. But uh, for extended objects like this ladder, we have to also demonstrate the points at which these forces are applied. So we'll start off with gravity, which always acts at the center of mass. And we'll say this ladder has a uniform mass density just to make things easier. So this is at, you know, half the length of the ladder. Then we have the normal force from the floor, the frictional force pushing that way because it's resisting resisting rather the tendency of the ladder to slide out from itself. And lastly, we have the force of the wall, which we'll write as FW. So we'll start off interpreting this uh, FBD in terms of the forces at work. So if we sum the forces in the x direction, we get the uh, friction minus the force of the wall equals zero because this ladder isn't moving. And if we sum the forces in the y direction, we'll just arbitrarily choose up as the positive point. Then we get that the normal force minus the weight equals zero. Solving for both of these, we get that the frictional force equals the force of the wall and the normal force equals the weight. Now we'll move on to the uh, torques involved. And if you'll recall, we can choose any axis for the torques in static equilibrium problems because any parallel axis will have the same amount of rotation, which is to say none. So we'll pick the axis at which the most forces act. In this case, the normal and floor or the normal and frictional force. So from here, we have, you know, uh, the sum of the torques equals the force of the wall times sine of theta, and that's acting at distance L away. Then we subtract the weight, which is trying to rotate the object in the other direction, so we'll write that as a negative torque. So that's just the force times where it's acting, L over 2, times the cosine of theta, because you can see it forms this triangle, so the perpendicular component is right here, uh, and theta is right in there. Now we know that uh, all these forces add up, or all these torques rather, add up to be zero because it's not accelerating uh, around the track. We can cancel out these L's because uh, both terms exist, and we'll move over the mg cosine theta to the other side. So we get that the force of the wall times the sine of theta equals mg cosine theta all over 2. Or that the uh, force of the wall equals mg over 2 cosine theta over sine theta, but we know from trig that that term right there is cotangent theta. And if you'll recall from our forces, we already determined that the frictional force and the wall force are identical due to the balance of forces in the x direction. So we know then that the frictional force from the floor is equal to mg cotangent theta over 2. And from here, all we have to do is solve for the uh, weight in terms of the normal force. Having already done that, we have the two component forces from the floor, the frictional and normal force. And if you wanted to, what you could do is find, you know, some F floor vector that it's acting somewhere between the normal force, we'll call this F floor, acting somewhere between the normal force and the frictional force. And then you could, you know, uh, combine them basically by taking the root, doing mg squared plus mg cotangent theta squared over 2. And you know you'd factor out the mg squared, etc. to get one single term. But it makes more sense to keep them in their constituent components just because, uh, I mean, it's two different forces entirely acting. But if you wanted to find the total magnitude that the floor is uh, exerting, this is the way you would do it. And of course, you could uh, also, you know, do the inverse tangent uh, 
of these two forces to find the uh, direction in which that floor force would be acting. Moving on now, we're going to look at a typical angular momentum problem. In this case, we have some mass of clay or, you know, a bullet or what have you moving with some velocity v towards a stationary disk with big mass, big M, and its uh, moment of inertia given by big M r squared. And you can see from this omega zero that it's initially not moving. And what we want to find is after these two collide, and we'll say that this mass sticks on here, uh, and rotates around causing this disk to move. We want to know what the speed of this mass is going to be after they collide. So because uh, there's no external torque acting on the uh, ball or the disk, we can say that uh, momentum, the angular momentum is conserved. Or more simply, L0 equals L final. And you'll recall that angular momentum is the moment of inertia times the angular speed. So we'll look at the initial angular momentum of the system. Now this disk isn't moving at all. This uh, omega term here is zero. Therefore the L zero of the disk is zero. But despite the fact that this mass is moving linearly, we know that it has angular momentum. So we'll look at it right before it collides with the disk just to make things easier so we don't have to worry about a sine theta term. Basically, what you have to remember is that uh, L0 also equals uh, R cross with P or R times P times the sine of theta. So if at this point right here, it's radial distance R away, its momentum is simply M times V, and the sine of theta between its position and its momentum vectors right here is just perpendicular, so it's 90 degrees. Sine of theta becomes 1. So the initial angular momentum of the system is just r times mv. With that known, we can now set that equal to the final angular momentum of the system. So we'll say that mvr equals i omega or mvr equals, we have to use our uh, theorem that uh, angular momentum, or excuse me, moment of inertia of a combined object is simply the addition of the two moments of inertia of the constituent objects. So in that case, that would be big M r squared as the moment of inertia of this hoop or disk plus the moment of inertia of this ball. In this case, that is simply uh, little m times r squared, because all the mass is certainly concentrated at the end of that radial vector. And we could multiply that immediately by this omega term, but we know that omega equals the final velocity, or at least the final omega, will equal the final velocity times the radius. So we'll write vf over r. Now from here, we can uh, cancel out an r term on both sides here and get rid of that exponent. And then this r term over here cancels out as well due to the r in the denominator. Now all we have to do to find the tangential final velocity of the bullet or block of clay on the end of this hoop is divide through by the constituent masses. So we get that the final velocity of the bullet, ball, block, clay, what have you, that sticks to the hoop is m times v, the initial momentum, divided by the total mass. All right, so moving on to the last problem in this section, we're going to be dealing with a something with a non-negligible moment of inertia rolling down a ramp. In this case, we have a disk with its uh, moment of inertia equals its mass times its radius squared all over 2. And what we want to do is find First of all, it's acceleration down the ramp, and then if we have time, the uh, minimum coefficient of friction such that it can roll without slipping down this ramp. So we'll start off as we always do by drawing our free body diagram. In this case, I'll just blow up the picture of the uh, disc. We'll add gravity first and foremost because that's the most obvious force acting on it. Next we have the normal force from the ramp coming through here as well as the frictional force, pulling it slightly backwards. 
And as you can see, this will exert a torque about uh, the axis right here. And what we can do, like we've done uh, with most previous ramp problems, is break up this mg vector into constituent components parallel to and perpendicular to the ramp. So now from here what we'll do is sum the forces, in this case as they pertain to uh, the ramp as well as the perpendicular forces. So the sum of the forces on the ramp equals the force pulling down mg sine of theta minus the friction and that all equals the mass times the linear acceleration. Similarly we have the perpendicular forces uh, in which mg cosine of theta minus the normal force equals zero or the normal force equals mg times cosine of theta and that's again because there's no acceleration perpendicular to the ramp it stays at a constant rate here. At this point we will sum the torques acting on this object and we'll use this center axis as our main axis so we don't have to deal with the two components of uh, gravity basically. So the sum of the torques acting on the object are the, oh forgot to label that frictional force, uh, the frictional force times the radius of the circle plus or that's times sine of 90 because they're perpendicular plus the normal force times the radius of the circle times the sine of 180 and now because the sine of 180 is 0 this term cancels out and this is all equal to I alpha. Now from here we know that uh, the frictional force times the radius times uh, sine of the angle between them which was 90 so FR equals I times alpha but we know that alpha equals A over R and the moment of inertia is mr squared over 2. So substituting that in, we get f times r equals mr squared over 2 times a over r, and we can cancel out these r terms to get the uh, acceleration equals 2 times the frictional force over the mass of the object. But we know from our sum of the forces that the frictional force equals uh, mg sine of theta minus ma. So substituting all that in and doing some more algebra, which I'm not going to do here because we're running out of time, you get that the acceleration equals 2 over thirds g sine of theta. And you can check your answer versus your own work right there. Now lastly, solving for mu, we know that uh, the frictional force equals ma over 2 from that algebra implied over here. Therefore, it's mu times the normal force equals ma over 2 by the definition of friction. From here, we know the normal force equals mg times cosine theta from our uh, sum of the forces. So mg cosine theta equals ma over 2. These masses will cancel out, and you get that mu equals uh, a over 2 g sine of theta, but recall that mu, or uh, that a rather, is 2 thirds g sine theta. So on the bottom right there, that should be cosine theta. But recall that a is 2 thirds g sine theta. That means that mu, substituting in and doing our trig property where sine over cosine equals tangent, we get that mu equals tangent theta divided by 3. And that concludes our coverage of rotation. In the next chapter, in the next few videos, we'll be looking at simple harmonic motion.